Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another exciting episode of Generally Irritable with Erica Reddick. Uh, this episode is actually pretty exciting. I am really, really pleased to have on today attorney John Franco. Uh, John, why don't you, should I introduce you? Do you want to introduce yourself? I should have planned this before we got started. I have known John. Here, I'll start. I've known John for more than a decade. Uh, we know each other because I used to work for an accounting firm in the same building as him. And uh, he used our printer, copy or fax machine, right? That was the deal you guys had. Still do. And the the pencil sharpener and the 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 what the 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 uh, what the what do you call it the, uh, uh, the the spring water that they have there. Yes. Oh, excellent. Okay, so you've got so you have they call a deal with services. Yes. <laughs> um, and so we were reacquainted when I moved back to Vermont in 2018 and started having problems with. Uh, the city regarding our house and the zoning issues and all this stuff. So I've talked about this a little bit on the show and I just knew the only thing I knew about John was that he fought for the little people. Like that's what I knew about John. His, his charge as an attorney was to fight for the little people. So he's walking through one day as we're dealing with all this nonsense with the city and I'm super mad. And I go, Hey John, you fight for the little guy. Right. And you said, and you said, uh, well, that depends on who the little guy is or something like that. And so we've been really excited to have you at, on, um, on our team to help with that suit with the city, uh, because you have so much historical knowledge about the city and about Vermont. And I love when I ask you questions, I get to see all the like gears spinning in your head and you're just like, oh, well, there was this case and this case and this case. And the disposition was this and this and this. And I said, who better to share with Vermonters uh, than John Franco to talk about qualified immunity? And I think we're going to get into a little bit about just immunity in general, because, John, I did not know there was sovereign immunity, absolute immunity, qualified. I didn't know there was like variations. So you're going to have to explain some of that. Um, but we're not just talking about, you know, there's been a lot of talk lately about qualified immunity for police officers, but that same immunity or similar immunity applies to your elected officials and municipalities as well. Yep. So they can do stuff and not be held liable. Yep. Right. Unless they're committing yep. a crime, basically. Like they have Immunity to do something actually civil, illegal. Civil liability, being sued civilly. Okay. Nobody is so, nobody is immune from criminal prosecution. Right. Exactly. So, John Franco, attorney at law. Why don't you give people, you know, a, a couple minutes to talk about? Uh, give them a couple minutes of, you know, who you are, uh, how you got here, and why you're so passionate about helping people. Um, because you really are. I mean. I, I can tell how passionate you are about the law and helping people. So what drives that passion for you? <laughs> well, I decided definitely to go to law school after working a year in a paint store after I got out of college. <laughs> and I came to the conclusion that the paint store wasn't my, uh, wasn't my calling. <laughs> uh, and uh, my father was also an auto dealer. And my mother used to say, you're not going into the car business like your father. And I said to my mother, you don't need to worry about that. <laughs> In the car business. Um, you know, I've been doing this for 43 years. I started practicing in 1978. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm at the different end of the political spectrum than you are, but I consider myself, I'm on the left, but I consider myself libertarian. Mm. Um, a lot of the stuff that's going on currently in politics, particularly from the left, I really have deep problems with, but that's a different discussion. Mm. How does this relate to sovereign immunity? This relates to people having recourse against the government that's supposed to represent them when the government screws them over mm. or the government injures them or, or government officials in, injure them or the government officials act arbitrarily and capriciously or they do it for, for retaliatory reasons. Um, and 
that's where the whole idea of immunity comes in. Um, when I, you know, when I was growing up, we were taught that what, you know, this was in the middle of the Cold War, and we were taught one of the things that distinguished the United States from, say, the Eastern Bloc or other countries is that people in this country had the right to sue their government. Mm. Um, that is sort of true, but not necessarily true. And in fact, the overriding doctrine that says that you can't sue the government is called sovereign immunity. And that mm. still is the kind of the, the foundational position of the law that what sovereign immunity says is that you can't sue the government unless the government says you can sue them. So then oh. what the debate becomes is how kind of them, how kind of them. And, and, um, and, and it, it's really just, a, if, you, if you read the Vermont constitution, which says that, um, you know, the government is just the expression of the people. And then it says right in the Vermont constitution, it's the people who are sovereign, not the government. Um, it puts a little twist on the idea, well, the government has sovereign immunity in that the people can't sue the government unless the government says they can be sued. So um, and it, and it's like in your case, in a lot of cases where people get people get harmed or hurt or screwed over by the government um, and they want to have recourse. And, and too many times, as we've seen uh, quite recently with, with police misconduct issues, um, they don't have recourse. So they don't have adequate recourse. It's very difficult to be successful in getting it. The, the hoops and the, the hurdles that are thrown up for people to try to get uh, get recourse against the government is so hard. It's such a deterrent for them to do it that most people give up, and it's the, the system is designed to do that. Um, so, so there's all kinds of there's a whole menu of immunities that we can go through. You might want to hand out some notos to your to your uh, <laughs> viewers here before we get into all the metaphysics of it. But um, I'll go through the metaphysics, and maybe you kind of deal with the indignation and the politics of of it. Well, let me, let me, that sounds great. Let me ask you a question to start with, right? So, so explain again, because you, I think you said it, but I want you to explain again what the foundational idea is for immunity. Is it that, so I heard you say, you know, the government is the expression of the people. And so therefore you'd be like suing the state, like your neighbors. Is it, is it that, you know, people can't possibly foresee the terrible things that are going to happen from the stupid policies that they enact. Like, what is the foundational idea for all of these kinds of immunities so that we can just kind of have that in the back of our mind as you're talking about this stuff? My point was that the basic idea of sovereign immunity as it's expressed in the law is a complete contradiction to what the Vermont mm. Constitution says. Because the Vermont okay. Constitution says it is the people who are sovereign and the government is just the represent, representatives and the expression of the people. And so, so therefore to say that the people can't sue the government who's supposed to be the representatives is a total contradiction. Now the idea of sovereign immunity comes directly from, keep in mind, we are in, for those of you who didn't go to law school, we are in what's called an Anglo-American common law uh, legal system. We have in Canada, except for Quebec, Quebec has a, a Napoleonic system. Uh, the rest of uh, the rest of uh, America is on the, on the, on the uh, Spanish system, which is a continental system. So we have an English common law system. The idea of sovereign immunity comes directly from British law, which says you can't sue the sovereign, which is the king or the queen. That's mm. where that idea comes from. You know, okay. you, can, you can't even turn your back to them. You've got to, when you leave the room, you've got to back out. You know, you've got to curtsy. You've got to do all this crap. And that's where the basic idea comes from out of, out of, out of, uh, out of English common law. Interesting. So I kind of got drafted onto American um, American law without so it, without the I, without the recognition of the contradiction of what that means because under U.S. law under U.S. constitutional law in uh, in Vermont Vermont constitutional law the people the people are the, the Vermont Constitution says the people are the sovereign not the government that's so, that contradiction. So how I'm just I'm hearing you say that and I'm thinking about how kind of anti-government the founding fathers were right like the founding fathers were pretty anti-government because they knew that it could suck right so they said we're going to try to make it the best possible type of government that we can you know taking the best of all these other systems it surprises me that they let that creep in given how many checks and balances they had and how the president wasn't supposed to be king and all that stuff well, you know, I mean, it's it's the ideology is fighting the revolution, but then when the revolution's over, 
political parties are in power and they want to hold on to their power and privilege, then you start getting the erosion of, uh, of that and you start getting the interjection of old ideas from British common law um, into the American, into the American uh, judicial, and uh, what's called American jurisprudence. Um, okay. I, w I would say that's probably the root of it, but the basic idea was, the basic idea of sovereign immunity is the the government is supreme and therefore the government can't be sued in its own in its own courts. How how can you do that? How can you sue the queen? She's the, she's the sovereign, you know. That who's, is his. Who's going to hold her accountable? Uh, she's the <laughs> no, she's accountable only to herself. She's the sovereign. <laughs> that's that's the idea. I mean, as crazy as it sounds, to, and you say about the founding fathers. I mean, look at the world they were operating in, and most of the most of Europe at least. Um, you know, you had monarchies that were there was a fusion of monarchies, and you had a state religion. And so, the you said that the idea that government sucked is an understatement. I mean, they were <laughs> entirely different here. And the idea of government that we have in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution was right out of uh, right out of John Locke, who was a British British philosopher in the in the 18th century. I mean, that's yeah. that's where that really that basically came from. But it was the Enlightenment and the Protestant Reformation. It was all that. All that it's that it started and i got i don't know when martin luther you know tacked his theses to the door of the church but i forgot what century it was in but it was after the printing press <laughs> didn't, didn't actually got to read the bible for themselves yeah when we got to when we actually got to read the bible for ourselves i tell people that all the time i'm like you hear a lot of things never let anybody read your bible for you pick it up read it yep. um that is amazing okay so that's so those are some of the kind of foundational questions. By the way, that's that a good we're working with who rely too much on social media too. <laughs> go to go to the original source, please. Por favor. That's what one of my favorite gifts. Oh no, I left it at the house. Um, one of my favorite gifts that Benjamin, my husband, has gotten for me is the Federalist Papers. Yeah, it's the complete work of the Federalist Papers. I'm just like, this is amazing. I mean, it's really hard to read, and you have to like you have to have a dictionary right next to you and like an old dictionary that has real words in it, not dictionary.com. Right. Uh, second best gift I've been given was from my friend Greg and it's a 1940s dictionary. It's awesome. Um, okay. So my concern, and I think a lot of people's concern, um, especially as we see the government really stretching its powers right now here in Vermont with the charter changes that we just uh, that were approved in Burlington. And then you've got the, you know, the climate stuff where they, you know, they don't care that they're bankrupting people and shutting businesses down and things like that. So there's a lot of us that feel like, and I'm not saying you feel this way. So this is, these are my words. A lot of us feel like the government is just it's got its hand too much in our lives. It's got our hand too much in our pocketbooks in our businesses and our homes and, you know, raising our kids and stuff like that. So how, as a concerned citizen, do I know, you know, where the government boundary is supposed to be? How do I fight back when they're doing stuff that is invariably going to create harm? You've just talked about political questions, which is very different than sovereign immunity. Sovereign mm -hmm. immunity is what do you do when there's a woman who's in a house on Stanford Road in Burlington who's the fourth member, fourth generation of her family that's lived in this house <laughs> that was built uh, before before the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. I love that phrase. And it never got a permit for it. At least we don't know that they ever got a permit for it. And now, 60 years later, the city of Burlington comes along and says, we're going to shut you down because you don't have a zoning permit. Correct. I mean, that, that is a major harm. A, you can fight that, fortunately. But if you win and you turn out to be correct, you don't have any recourse against the city, city for having you to, have, forcing you to spend the amount of money that you've had to spend in order to maintain – the use of a property that's been in the same use since January of 19. Exactly. So basically our choices are short sell it uh, at a loss for somebody who will pay cash for it because the volume of work that would have to be done to ha please the city is just too much. We yep. don't know. Yep. So that's, it's either that or spend tons of money on legal fees in the hopes and 
prayers that the court rules in favor of what the actual law says. Right. Right. And so I the mean, that seems like why crappy. You, why you, why can't you sue the zoning administrator for having a very for overreaching in in, in his interpretation of the of the, Correct. the statute? Let yes. me put it that way. Or for yes. the judge who's over who's who's overreached in the interpretation of the statute and has adopted a construction that actually contradicts with the intention of the legislature is what's your recourse for that? Other than challenging that and hopefully you win in court. In order to get your money back, the answer is no. You don't have any recourse, and the answer for that is sovereign immunity. Sovereign immunity. And the reason for that, the reason you can't go after the, the, the zoning administrator is because under Vermont law for municipalities, if it's a governmental function, the governmental function has sovereign immunity. You cannot sue them for it. Um, the reason you can't go, you can't sue the judge is because uh, – there is a uh, absolute immunity for uh, judges, legislators, and high executive officials in the government. It's an absolute immunity. You can't sue them. You cannot sue them. Even if they're making decisions that are contrary to law and precedent. Especially when they make decisions that are contrary to law and precedent. Yep. Especially. How? How is this allowed? How? Because. I'll tell you why it's allowed. Okay. First of all, let me, let me walk the... The viewers through um, some wonderful, the best, what I call the best hits of sovereign of, of immunity, <laughs> sovereign immunity uh, under Vermont law, and then a little later in the program we'll talk about what's going on federally with qualified immunity. Uh, one of my favorites. This is an oldie but goodie. This decided in 1977. I think the uh, uh, oh god, uh, never, I, 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 I'm blanking out here. I'll get it in a moment. It was my second year of law school. It's called it's a case called Dugan versus City of Burlington. Mr. Dugan stepped in either a, a, a great a, a sewer grate or fell into a manhole or something in Burlington oh, and was injured gosh. and went to the city of Burlington. And the city of Burlington claimed sovereign immunity. And so the question, this is want to talk about the earth-shattering questions that appear before the Vermont Supreme Court. The question in resolving this was whether or not the catch basin was connected to the sewer system, which would make it not subject to sovereign immunity because the sewer system is considered part of the proprietary function of the city of Burlington, meaning the water, the water and wastewater system that was considered proprietary, or was it whether it was part of the street drainage system for the street and the street is governmental and that would have been governmental and he couldn't sue the city if the grade was attached to the street. So the question was, did the grate serve the sewer system or the grate serve the street drainage system? Um, as it turned out, it, it served both. So wait, um, what is... Okay, I, wait, 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 I don't wait. honestly know how they actually resolved that. But So wait, so, so this, is kind of, this is a kind of crazy-ass distinction that you get about whether or not something's immune or not. The, the That's what I'm saying. Like, Aren't they both city the departments? departments? considered proprietary. This is, they're both city departments. The police department is governmental. The uh, fire department is governmental. The zoning administrator is governmental. Uh, but Burlington Electric is proprietary. Um, probably the airport is proprietary. The water and wastewater system is proprietary. What? Um, How? The, probably, I'm sure, the, uh, the uh, city recycling uh, pickup system is considered proprietary. Are they like these are the are they, these like, are just really crazy ass distinctions? In fact, in this, I think it was in this Hudson case, the lawyers in that case said, "Why don't you get rid of this? This is nuts." And the court wouldn't do it. That's what I'm saying. So what? Why is why is one of those a government agency and one is not when they're both all government agencies? Like, how do you? Well, what is the distinguisher? Charge. It's like any. It's like a private water system. You don't pay it. You don't use taxes to pay for it. It's paid through for a fee. You get a water bill every month, and it's based upon how much water you consume. That was that's the different. That's the basic idea. It doesn't matter who owns it. It's whether it how's it how's okay. It. Course, so that's what you real, said. Real problem is most city departments have a combination of taxes and user fees. So I mean, it's just it is to use a, a Yiddish word. It is mashugana. It makes no sense. <laughs> it's crazy, but. They and they were the Supreme Court was invited to abandon it. Now I can get in. I will get into in a minute what the state the rule for state government is on sovereign immunity because it's different. It's different than the municipal. So rule. wait, 
Okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, wait. You just said, shoot, what did you just say? I was good. Crap. There was so much there. So, you, whoa, you said the state was invited to restate it? The Supreme Court was invited to, keep in mind, these are all judicially, these are all rules that have been adopted by the courts and their decisions. In other words, that's what the common law, we have a common law system. And the courts and the court decisions have drawn this distinction between proprietary and governmental. And in one of these cases, it might have been the Hudson case, it might have been another one, the Supreme Court was invited to scrap this. They said it doesn't work, it's stupid. They refused to do it. So, okay, wait. Okay, so wait. So, the argument was, remember the old thing, remember the old Life Serial ad with Mikey and had yeah. Mikey try it to see if Mikey liked it? Well, the Supreme it Court had the Mikey excuse. They said, well, you know, the legislature could change this if they wanted to, and they never have, so we're not going to. That was the, that was the reasoning they used. So, okay, so it's not actually written into the law that there is a difference between, I'm sorry, proprietary and, and governmental. And governmental. So the law doesn't say there's a difference, but okay. some court decided at some point that for whatever reason there was a difference. And therefore, ergo, henceforth, what? that we've decided that they are different somehow. But any rational person looking at that is like, no, it's not. It's the same thing. Well, let me and give Supreme you an example how crazy ass this is. Okay. 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 That's it versus East Montpelier. Well, if you can't sue the municipality, can you sue the person that worked for the municipality? And that's where official immunity comes in. Okay. Mm. And this is this gets just really bizarre. And I <laughs> I don't understand it. I've been practicing law for 43 years. I don't think anybody else will. As I said, there's absolute immunity. If you're a high mucky muck, you're absolutely immune. If you're an attorney general or a judge or a legislature, you can't be sued. There's qualified immunity for office holders that perform ministerial acts, but not acts of, um, of, uh, of uh, discretion, who don't perform discretionary duties. And then there's a different standard for lower level government employees who perform discretionary duties. So the question is whether or not the duty is ministerial or discretionary. If you think I have any ghostly notes about an idea, what the hell that means? I do not. What's ministerial? I don't even know what ministerial means. don't know what the hell that means. We usually come up with a result we like, and then we plug in the rationale for it. But anyway, Hudson versus East Montpelier involved a lawsuit. I, I don't know what the guy was a snowplow driver for East Montpelier. Okay. And I don't know if his plow knocked down mailboxes or knocked down fences or knocked down walls or something, but somebody got Hudson got ticked off and sued um, and, and tried to sue the, the, uh, the, the, the driver for it. And so then the question was well, the town of East Montpelier can't be sued for the snowplow driver knocking down the mailboxes. How can the, 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 the driver of the truck be sued for it? Um, and um, the <laughs> strange as it may seem, the Supreme Court said, yes, you can sue and collect from the, some, from the snowplow truck driver because um, the act of driving a snowplow does not involve any official discretion or uh, policy and, there, and then what they said is the whole reason what? for this having immunity is that we don't want to, number one, we don't want to uh, hamper public officials from uh, vigorously discharging their duties in a prompt and decisive manner. In other words, we don't want <laughs> we don't want lawsuits so that public officials are looking over their shoulders, worrying about getting sued and pull their punches about how they administer the law. And number two, um, we don't want to subject um, – how government policy is implemented by second guessing by the judiciary because that violates separation of powers. Those are uh, those are administrative and legislative decisions, not judicial decisions, and we're not going to second guess that. So, having but they that, are. Wait a minute. The Supreme Court said driving a snowplow truck driving a snowplow truck doesn't involve any of those things, and therefore the poor guy isn't immune and he gets sued. So that was the logic of Hudson versus East Montpelier. I mean, he's, I just, you know, he's, just, he's just the guy, he's just the hourly worker driving in the middle of the night. On Christmas Eve, not home with his family if there's a snowstorm. <laughs> so this is this the is stuff, stuff when you when explain, you explain it, to it to me, John. John. Oh, I'm getting a weird echo. When you explain it to me, it just makes my head hurt. Because, like, 
none of that, first of all, you can't even say that it's, uh, you know, an intrusion on the separation of powers because it's not even the legislature who made up the rule in the first place. It was the court. And then, so, so the court would be the one actually who would have to rule differently in order to change the precedent moving forward. And they declined to do it. <laughs> they declined to do it. I think this is so fascinating. Okay. So. Well, as they say on the infomercial, there's more. Oh, so you have this, okay, this is what it is in municipal law. You have the state has sovereign immunity. I mean, there's governmental immunity. There's not immunity for proprietary functions. And then if you go down the food chain to suing the actual individuals who did the thing, um, there, there would be official immunity like the zoning administrator. You probably would be able to get away with suing the zoning administrator because he's an municipal officer. And um, um, you would uh, not be able to sue them for uh, – uh, his discretionary uh, execution of his duties for exactly the reason I talked to. They don't want to have, they don't want to have people that enforce the law or set policy having to be worried about looking over their shoulder. Uh, they want to have their duties done in a prompt and decisive manner. And then also they don't think the judiciary should be uh, second guessing how the zoning administrator uh, 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 performs his functions, even though the zoning administrator is in a quasi judicial role. But that's another question. So uh, I, this is the this is the this is the morass of immunity in the, under for municipalities. Then when you get the state, the state immunity rules make a little bit more sense than this. Okay. Okay. State immunity rules aren't so crazy. What the state immunity rule says, and we have something called the Tort Claims Act. And what the state immunity rule says, again, there's the act where the state has waived sovereign immunity. And they said these this is under these circumstances we waive sovereign immunity. And the basic rule is that the state waives its sovereign immunity for negligent or wrongful, uh, let me get the word here, for negligent or wrongful acts of an employee acting within their scope of their duties. Um, if they are acting under circumstances in a manner and extent as a private person would be liable. This Wait. is called, excuse me, this is called the so-called private analog. If there is an is a, if there is an analog to what somebody would do privately, if the state is doing something that's analogous to what somebody would do privately, then the state is liable for the wrongful discharge of that responsibility, just as um, a private person would would be. What's uh, an example of that? Oh, let me give you two of them. The most maybe the most famous formulation of that was in 1995. Was a case called Sabia versus State. Sabia was a suit brought by uh, wards of the state that were put in foster care and they were sexually um, abused by um, the foster parents and the state was completely negligent in the supervision of the, of the home. And um, that was a very <clears throat> heavily contested case. Um, and uh, it was one of the rare cases where the, the Supreme Court said, you know, and I think it was because of the facts of the case why they allowed it. They said this has a private analog to uh, supervision of, uh, of, uh, of people in a home. It's a neg mm. like negligent supervision case, and we're going to allow it. So they allowed the lawsuit in that case. So um, what would be – is that like parenting is the yeah, analog? Parenting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the argument on the other side was there wasn't really a, an analog to state supervision of foster homes, but the Supreme Court came up with one and allowed that suit to go forward. Uh, Kurt Hughes I'm from – he has actually litigated that case. That was 25 years ago, but that was a very big landmark case in Vermont regarding the State Tort Claims Act. Let me give you two other ones. Another one called Kinney versus State. This was decided in 2011. This was a case where um, the mother of an elderly woman had called the police, state police, and asked them to do what's called a welfare check on their mother. A welfare mm. check is to have somebody come in and check whether or not that person is okay because – I think the mother was was getting uh, well was getting seen on, and uh, what happened was the state troopers went to the wrong address. <laughs> they didn't find anything wrong, and so they didn't report anything. Well, the reason they went to the wrong address was the address on the house was an even numbered address, and so the uh, the address was on the mailbox 
on the side of the road with this with it was they had a number of it was 392. So they went into 392. What they thought was 392, but it wasn't 392. The mailbox of 392 was on the other side of the road. 392 is the other oh, side. Oh wow. Hang on. I, I hope I don't oh nuts. Did I just lose you? Nope. Nope. I'm just focusing on you when uh you're talking okay about good stuff i got, just got a pop-up i'm sorry eh. so anyway <laughs> the long and the short of it is the, the officer screwed up and went to the wrong house the woman wow. was outside in her backyard and fallen down and couldn't get up and suffered this was in the winter and suffered from hypothermia she didn't die immediately but after about a week she died of hypothermia and so the oh, state was sued God. and the Supreme court said a welfare check has a private analog and therefore the state was liable for that okay What's uh, the private analog of that? That people do check up on other people. People are asked to check up on other people. And if they dis if they accept that responsibility and they do it negligently, then they're liable for the negligent discharge. Of the day. That's the general. Torts was never my strong suit in law school, but um, that's, that's the basic theory. Here. That's interesting. Now, another case where they didn't allow it was a case I was involved in. It was a case called uh, Barry, uh, Edson versus Barry Supervisory Union. Uh, was decided in 2007. That was um, actually a lawsuit oh. against my high school, Barry Spalding High School. Yep. There was a Florucci who was a sophomore at Spalding, um, and she was lured out of uh, out of school. She had had she had, the had been having problems. She'd been having school problems. She'd been having behavioral problems. A lot of it had to do with her family situation with her mother. Her mother and her mother's first husband were not the best. Her mother remarried, and her mm. Her, her new stepfather and her mother were uh, much more attentive uh, to her needs and put her on a pretty strict regimented schedule about her. She was going to school. She had to go to school. She had to go through her classes. She had to go back. I think she had to walk back to where her, her new, her stepfather worked was in one of the granite sheds just across the street mm -hmm. had to report him and so forth and so on. Well, there was this guy who was this very sick person, mass murderer named uh, Dana Martin in Barry who sent, somebody down to the lost to the law school to the high school to lure her out of class and to go to party at his house up on uh, off of camp street in barry mm. uh, she was lured, not only was she lured out of the school by this not by dana martin by the guy but by the guy she, she sent down the principal of the school ran into this guy in the hallway three times i mean this is right out of the bible you know wow three times before the cock crow. three times didn't escort him off the premises, knew the guy didn't have any business being there, actually told the guy to leave. This guy lures her out of class. And her, it was her last two modules. She wasn't there. Up to this place was on uh, Delmont Avenue in Barrie, where, the, where this young girl was beaten, sexually assaulted, driven up to uh, the rural area of, of Orange, Vermont, and thrown off a bridge into a stream to die. Thrown off the bridge naked into the stream to die. Wow. And so we, brought, we tried to bring a negligence suit against the, uh, the against Spalding for, you know, you had this guy running around the school. Um, and I think they had an idea that he, they knew that he was looking for her as well. Um, and the, the court just, the court wouldn't allow, wouldn't allow us to sue the, 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 the high school for it. Why is that not? I mean, you know, the, 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 the official reason they gave, which didn't make any sense, they said, well, it wasn't foreseeable that something like this could happen. Every parent of a teenager, that's their worst nightmare. Of course, it's foreseeable. I actually made that. I made the worst nightmare argument. I said, you've got to be kidding me. What? A parent doesn't worry that if an older man lures a girl, a 14-year-old girl out of high school, there might be sex involved? Really? So, that's not but, foreseeable? Well, and that's if 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 the person who screwed up the welfare check, if that's considered something that's done by a can be there's an analogous to a private citizen, then how is it like not the same thing if you're the principal and you see a grown man that doesn't belong there? Why wouldn't there any be anything analogous to that? Three times, I mean, not one, what not one screw up with a welfare check. Three times, three times they had an opportunity to ask, and it was against. And they had a whole policy about people that aren't students or, or faculty members being in. Uh, keep in mind, this was after nine eleven. 
So the old days when I went to high school, you could go out by the river and smoke pot and then go back to class. Those days were over. Everything was shut down. And, um, you know, you had to go through, you had to go through and you had to report in the front and so forth and so on. So this guy's roaming around, you know, the doors are locked. And this guy's roaming around the high school and they didn't escort him to the door, to a locked door so he couldn't come in. Is Here's it, the real reason they didn't do it. They, okay. didn't want, they didn't want the taxpayers of the city of Barrie to have to pay for the criminal acts of this, of this psychopath. That's what it was about. It was because it was criminal conduct. That is, <coughs> excuse me. But isn't that, so this is the thing that, <clears throat> excuse me, I really just got something in my throat there. It seems like, <clears throat> to me, there's not even a equal application of the law. It's like, what judge you get matters, it sounds like. I, I get the argument that you don't want to make taxpayers liable for something that they didn't do right because ultimately if you're suing the city i'm suing my neighbors uh they're gonna pay for it if i've been harmed somehow but so there's they're not applying the law equally it depends on what judge you get whether or not they're actually going to go by what the rules or the precedent says and then And then still, there's no liability or accountability for the people that we yeah. we put in charge. Well, there's not. I won't say there's never because clearly, in the case of a uh, mm. case of the the, 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 the people for uh, at that time it was called SRS, who were charged with supervising these foster kids in the Saudi, mm. and also the state troopers that had you know, and it was an innocent mistake. It was the mailboxes on the opposite side of the road. I mean, it was understandable, but they allowed them to recover. And you, you allow recovery there, and you have an egregious case where the principal of the, of the high school has mm. his yo yo line <clears throat> running around the, the halls of the high school. Yeah. Sort of off the premises. Um, you know, and they say, well, no, um, that's not, you know, that's not culpable negligence on the part of the school district. Because the, 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 the rationale they use is that the harm that befell her wasn't foreseeable. Of course, it's foreseeable. It's what every parent's worst nightmare is. Uh, well, what is foreseeable? Said, You've got to be kidding me. It's not foreseeable. And that that's one of those words that people can manipulate and just decide what they think is reasonable or not. It is, it is exactly what you thought. They come up with the result they want and then they come up with the rationale to fit it. So the foreseeability was the, was the, what they hung their hat on. So to, to be, they, they, they came up with the decision that we're not going to have the taxpayers of Barry pay for what Dana Martin did to this girl. And so then the rationale they use is while well, they use foreseeability, even though even though the school administrators were clearly negligent. I would say they were arguably grossly negligent. Well, and then, so then where do we as citizens, how can we even feel safe about, you know, if something happens to us or if, you know, we're harmed in some way? You know, there you you mentioned something about earlier before we went live about knowing the rules of the game. Yeah. And and that the the agreement is that you know there is a defined set of rules and everybody knows what the rules are ahead of time. Right. And that's how you can have a free society. I think that was how you said it. Well, it was the, the idea of the enlightenment was that the whole idea of the rule of law is that mm. you cannot have a functioning economy if people don't know. They can't engage in commerce if people don't know what the rules of the game are ahead of time. So that when they enter into commercial transactions, so they do things. So they know what the consequences are going to be, and they know what the rules are. They know what their responsibilities are, and they know what the responsibilities of the other person are. That's very different than, say, systems where you have like a kleptocracy in Russia where – everybody's everybody's on the take there's corruption all over the place nobody really knows what the rules of the game are it's, it's what you know and who you can pay off um and the whole idea of the rule of law is that um the latter of the, the russian situation 
or the situation that you had prior to the uh, the Enlightenment and the Reformation is not conducive to a modern functioning economy, modern functioning society. And the problem with all these exceptions and all and all these uh, um, um, inconsistencies is that uh, the more complex things, that's one of the problems with our society with the law, the more complex things become, the less certainty and confidence people have in what they do and what the law is going to bring. And that really has, I think, a very corrosive effect. I think that's a big reason why people don't trust government now. You're having a bigger and bigger problem with people trusting government. You know, um, they just don't know. They, don't, You know, I, I always say, I, I, and I'll talk about this, when I first started practicing, um, when you read decisions of the Vermont Supreme Court in the, you know, this was like in the 1970s, they were very simple but elegant decisions that would lay out a basic principle of law that you could mm. then take to the bank. There weren't a lot of parsing or distinctions for it. There was mm. basic rules. And I think that was a function of the fact that in that era, the Vermont Supreme Court knew that Vermont was primarily an, an agricultural uh, mm. uh, state, an agricultural society. People didn't have a lot of spare cash to hire lawyers to fight about nuances of things, and that the court understood that people that people in the state needed to have a basic statement of what the rules of the game were so they could go out and then act accordingly. And boy, have in, in, in my 40-some-odd years of practicing law, man, have we gotten away from that. I mean, well, I love the old decisions of the Vermont Supreme Court in the 40s and 50s and, and, and 60s in early 70s, I mean, you could get, they were just simple statements of what the rule was. And they say, okay, this is the rule. And they wouldn't, you could go to court and they wouldn't try to parse it away. They wouldn't try to distinguish it. They wouldn't ignore the yeah. previous decision. Back into the decision by making up a bunch of nonsense that sounds that's, like it was a rule that's at some being point. Result -oriented. That, by the way, that, <laughs> that, that approach is being, called being result-oriented. Right. And it, that to me, that is, that is one of the most egregious examples of uh of overreach or um stomping on separation of powers the judicial uh the ju judiciary's job is to is to determine whether something is lawful or not not to write legislation or write policy uh not in a common law jurisdiction that's not true i hear i hear every time there's a conservative judge who is up for appointment and he says all we do is call balls and strikes that is total polyunsaturated horseshit. We are in a common law jurisdiction. The major part of the law in this country is to what's called is is by case law. It's by judicial interpretation. Okay. Federal state, it doesn't matter. That's that's if you want this kind of system where the judges don't make the law, then you have a continental system like um, like France or Italy or, or 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 Spain. But we have a we have a common law system. The judges, in fact do write the law and do make the law up. They do not call balls and strike. They write the, what the rules of the game are. Well, they then what's the point of having, having the pictures mad? That's because somebody decided 200 years ago, that's what the deal is. <laughs> then how come, no, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. If that is the case, then why is there separation of powers at all? Why don't we just have judges so they can write the law and decide whatever yeah. they feel like yeah. today? Yeah. Uh, if it's precedent or not. And then, I mean, that's basically what they're doing anyway. Well, the, the fallback argument though, is that if the legislature wants to change these decisions, what these what are called the common law decisions that the judges make, they're always free to do it. They can overrule it. That's happened. That's happened in a number of cases in Vermont. There was a case, a famous case several years ago called the Bianchi decision that said that, um, if you didn't have proper permits for your property, it was actually a, a, a uh, it affected your, your land title. Um, and that decision was made by the Supreme Court over a strong dissent by the then, then Chief Justice of the state. And he said, this is just going to be a disaster. It turned out to be a disaster. And it, there was, it took several acts of the legislature to correct the mayhem that that particular decision created. Uh, but the general. So, why can't we sue those judges for that? You know, what happens in the United States is that. Legislation gets passed, and more often, and not then through judicial decision, it's death by a thousand cuts. They construe it into oblivion. They construe it so it's impossible to work with, or it's so expensive to try to get any recourse that nobody's going to bother it. That happened with the antitrust laws. It's happened with the civil rights laws. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. It's happened with the anti discrimination laws. It's happened with the Equal Pay Act. I mean, it's just that's what happens. That's so what happens. 
Oh my God, John, this is the stuff that just makes me like, oh, oh, oh. Okay, so, so what is a normal, like, what could we do? Let's say, let's just say, I'm just throwing this out there. We get a bunch of liberty-minded people elected to office. And they say, you know what? Enough of all this nonsense. The the common law precedent, I'm going to use the wrong words, so correct That's me. Like the common law system. The common law system, the precedents that have been set by the judiciary, this is all nonsense. It's too complicated. Screw you. We want to just get rid of all of this stuff. Like, is that feasible? Like, what would we have to do as Vermonters to fix? Okay, so it's a two-part question. What would we have to do to fix the cluster that is the law here, you know, especially the voluminous layers of compliance and zoning and all of this, right? So can we, can it be fixed? Can it be simplified? And how? If you I think, think you're another question. The law system that this state is based on that, you know, the phrase about turning an aircraft carrier. No. It's too baked in. It's just too baked in. What you've got to do is, um, and I think really, I think a lot of this is really the, the fault of the judges and the, the political culture in the court system. Mm. That there needs to be, there's need, there needs to be a, um, there needs to be a, a culture of more simplicity um, in 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 the decision making that we used to have. Well, let me give you an example where you're seeing this now. Um, law schools are really struggling now because um, law students have come to the conclusion that it's just not worth. Um, the hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt that students have to go into in order to get a legal education now. Mm. And then when they get out, um, there really aren't the jobs there that either, they're either going to be able to make a living. We'll say nothing about paying off that student loan. Mm. And, there's, and then also the, the big law firm system is so top heavy and so expensive now that's starting to implode, but that's all driven by the complexity you know, it's the old joke about the one lawyer in town who starved the two who made a fortune. The more <laughs> lawyers you have, the more the, the complexity feeds on the complexity. I mean, it's mm -hmm. all part of game theory because we're always trying to get ahead of the next person. So if somebody comes up with this this uh, 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 clever distinction about how this case is different than the other case, and then then, then the complexity just grows exponentially. And yeah. now that is really that's really having, I think, a, a crushing effect on uh, on the legal system. The the, the there's Law firms are contracting, and then you throw COVID on top of it. Um, the number of the number of law firms in Vermont are contracting pretty significantly now. Um, they're coming to realize that they really can't afford the overhead that it takes to run law firms. Uh, people, I mean, Erica, you know this better than anybody. The expense of even having to litigate a simple case in the courts is to, it's prohibitive for most people. It's prohibitive. Yeah. They just go, I can't afford that. Like your case, screw it. I'm just going to have to leave the second apartment empty and and and. And we'll, we'll make whatever changes we can. That's what we're going to have to do. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the reality. That my, I get a lot of yeah. landlords in Burlington that were faced with that and, and not fighting this stuff. They just yeah. don't feel it's, it's, it's worth it for them to do it. Yeah. Well, and then it's it's people are confused about why things cost so much here and why there are so many problems and, you know, housing and whatever. And that's one of the other things. So I'm going to. I might I might add in one of my my crazy harebrained theories into this part of the conversation. Um, so take a city like Burlington, where we have a major housing shortage. Uh, we have a major, major housing shortage brought on primarily by the the ineffectiveness or the unprofitability of building housing here, right? So when you've got, I don't you know, accept that at all. I'm sorry. What? I don't accept that at all. That's not you don't think problem. so? We've added. Look at. We've added a shitload of housing units to the housing stock in the city of Burlington. The problem has been that in the last thirty or forty years, the size of the average household unit has consistently shrunk. So what's happened is we've had pretty much the same population that we've had. For forty years, about forty thousand, but because of the because of the the household size is shrunk, we've needed more and more units to house them. Oh, number one. Number so the number it's two problem. The number two problem is the University of Vermont continues and has for 
50 years housed only about half of its popular, uh, half of its, uh, its student population. And it's thrown the other half you know, onto the housing, rental housing market in the city. Yeah. Um, in the ethic at UVM was, it was that way when I went to school and it is now. Well, but why not? The, what that means there's a shortage of housing. Not out of the second two. But that means that there's a shortage of housing as the student population grows. That's not calculated into that. Yep. Resident. Yep. Total. Yep. Absolutely. Well, how is that not a housing shortage? Well, but I'm saying that's a reason for it. That's oh, a reason. you're saying so? You don't think it? You don't think that there's any? thing where people don't want to build here because of the expense with all the act 250 regulations. Oh, I, think and I think there's some of that, but I don't think that's the fundamental reason. Not at all. Interesting. I think the it's the presence of UVM. I think that definitely doesn't, doesn't help. So then, okay. So then, okay. My question still remains the same, I guess. So how we have a shortage of housing, it yep. causes prices to increase, right? Basic economics, supply yep. and demand. And the, I believe the city has the power to actually do something about that. And they don't. Such as? So as an example, the city of Burlington does not have, like, we don't have to be forced or maybe the state, we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't have to uh, rent to college kids. What if, it's what if? The college, not they have to, is want to. I mean, you've got a, you've got a lot of college kids that are from uh, from families that are from as we say here down country that are very affluent and will, will pay pay top dollar for uh, frankly some housing stock that isn't the best uh, in the world. And look what's so, happened! Look what's happened in the housing market everywhere in the last year as a result of COVID. I mean, you've got people buying up properties like crazy. I mean, the stories it's I'm out of now, control. It's out of control. I'm mean, this guy that's my actually my physical therapist. He's about the same age as my stepson, and he has a girlfriend are shopping for houses. And they said, you know, the, 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 there's an asking price, and somebody comes along and pays fifty thousand dollars over asking price, no conditions, no financing, cash on the barrel, had sight unseen, and they had, didn't even do a housing inspection. And there's, the, one of the reasons for that is that a lot of, there's a lot of people that actually made a lot of money in the pandemic, and they're looking for a place to invest their money, and they're investing it in housing. And it's going on all over the country. Well, and that really kind of thing has been going on. Appraisal. Everybody had a hissy fit. Oh, well, yeah. Well, and that kind yeah. of stuff has been going on in Vermont for many years. I remember kids that I went to college with, you know, 20 plus years ago, whose parents, instead of just paying their rent, bought an apartment building yep. for yep. their kid to live in. Yep. And so yep. you've got a bunch of people who have a vested interest in the cost of, of the property values continuing to ratchet up and those yeah. same a lot of those same people are in charge in their elected officials they're in positions of power and influence they hook up their buddies yeah. um during in zoning and compliance you know they they do favors for the people that they're friends with I, you know, I mean, look, agree I, with I'm, that? Not a, I'm not a big fan of I'm not a big fan of the way zoning. I'm, I've never been really a big fan of zoning because I've always felt that at the end, I like I like here are the rules that you go by. My experience with zoning and with Act 250 it was if they liked your project, they would bend the rules to make sure it happened. If they didn't like the project, they would bend the rules to make sure the project never happened. And it's so totally, it's totally stinky, unfair, corrupt, awful. And so this is this is the kind of stuff that with the rules of the game, it's the people that we have in charge, the elected officials, and then the people that they appoint and hire to facilitate said rules break the rules. And so the how is it? What can we do to either? Is it possible to get rid of sovereign immunity or official immunity or any of these immunities so that these bad actors can't continue to parse out the rules as they see fit? The problem with that is what I just said about the Florucci case. At the end of the day, I mean, first of all, you're going to have the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and all the police association and all these people coming in saying, oh, you can't eliminate immunity because it's going to cost the taxpayers more money. 
We're going to have to spend more in insurance. We're going to have to spend more money in lawyers. Wouldn't people why be a lot should, more thoughtful about who they elect? Why should the taxpayers have to pay because some municipal well, official but, screwed but up? Or well, that's the but, basic argument. That's the basic argument. But won't people then? Won't people then take responsibility for who they're electing and actually pay attention? Because here's the problem: is most people don't know the thing about bureaucracies is they basically function in anonymity. Do you have any idea what's going on with the amendments to the Code of Federal Regulations right now? No, nor should you if you have any kind of meaningful life, because if you do, <laughs> you're, you should be going off to an institution someplace, okay? And, you know, what all the little vagaries of the interpretive rules, whatever, or the changes to the, oh, God, the changes to the zoning bylaws of Burlington, uh, you know, people don't keep up with those. And that's the, that's the problem. It's hard. It's so hard to police it. And then you don't know it until you get caught up in it. When you get caught up with it, most people realize they're, they've got a dilemma of spending a fortune to try to be vindicated or just rolling over and saying, you know, screw it. I'm just not And that is it. not, that should not be how our legal system works. I know. I know that. So what do we do? Well, part of what we do is we do what you do is you fight them. You fight City Hall. You say no. You say we're not going to put up with this. It's, but yeah, it's but, very hard to do and it's very expensive to do. Well, and that's the thing. So that's what I'm saying. Like, how do, how, what can we do as regular people? Is it a matter of just electing new people? Is it a matter of like overturning these ordinances? Is it a matter of getting normal people who can do math appointed to committees and commissions? I, you know, I, that's, that's, that's a tough, that's a tough one. I mean, I just think you're dealing with, you know, it's a political culture in the state. It's a political culture in this country. And you've got to change, if, if you, you've got to change the political culture. So it's manifested in all these levels, whether it's in the judiciary or in the, in the towns and cities, the select boards or the, 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 the city councils or whether it's in legislatures, whether it's in these other boards and commissions that they have, the more, the more sensitive to um, and more attuned to, the dysfunctionality of what they do. I mean, things sound great on an individual basis and nobody sits back and says, wait a minute. What, what are the, the second and third order effects? About the, the unintended consequences. I yeah, think it was, that's I think like, it was, one of the things that I think it was Donald Rumsfeld that said this, and I was never a big fan of Donald Rumsfeld, but he said one thing that's absolutely true. He says, in war, there are three things. There's the known knowns. There are the known unknowns. But he says what gets you is the unknown unknowns. It's the unknown things that you don't anticipate. And that's – some of the unknown unknowns were, were brought up or the uh, – uh, 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 were brought up in the debate about this uh, this uh, uh, just cause eviction. Um, and they said, wait a minute. There could be an unintended consequence here. You could have a really uh, – a person that's at least a very unpleasant tenant who maybe isn't violated the law, but it's just short of it. Landlord can't get rid of that person. This person is hostile to people of color, hostile to women, you name it. Could be a homophobe. Yep. Yep. And the landlord is really handcuffed to being able to get rid of them. Those are the laws of un unintended consequences. And people that become really, um, what's the word I'm thinking of, very, very passionate about the justice of their cause, oftentimes, I mean, we all do this, don't want to hear about the unintended consequences that may happen from what they do. Well, like Sarah George, as an example, she has decided not to prosecute people that commit crimes. And well, I, I, I don't do criminal law, so I don't, this isn't really kind of my area of, well, of, of background. When I say unintended, I'm just speaking of unintended consequences is violent crime has risen in Burlington and in Chittenden County because there are violent people not going to jail anymore. And to me, that has to be foreseeable that when you, when we're talking about questions of, of, of foreseeable, reasonable expectation, you know, that kind of stuff, like how are some of these things not foreseeable? How does, how does the city council not understand that when they raise fees and taxes and all that other stuff that affordability is going to go down. Okay. Let, like, let, let's, let's get off this. Again, I don't do criminal law. I don't have a background okay. that I really don't okay. feel comfortable in talking about that, but let's, let's go back to something I am comfortable with. Okay. Your zoning case, because you just put your finger on it. 
What the hell is the point of the city's enforcement against your property having an additional, uh, uh, I think it's, what is it? It's an efficiency unit on the second floor of your apartment that was built by your grandparents, which is an affordable unit. People are crying about the lack of affordable housing in Burlington. What is the freaking point? Another case, it's a companion case to yours. Guy owns a property on Western Street, not far from me in Burlington. Property has, Burlington now has this ordinance called a functional family unit ordinance. Oh, yeah. It says that if you are renting a, a dwelling unit to more than four unrelated adults, you have to show to the zoning administrator that they are a functional family, whatever the hell that means. Mm. Okay. And so this particular property, they've decided in, uh, God knows when, 2018, to go after this, this, this one unit that has been rented to college students, five college students, since, well, I'll tell you, the last time we were able to track down, they actually got a zoning permit for it uh, in November of 1972 on the evening that uh, Richard Nixon defeated George McGovern. <laughs> that's how old that one was so they not as old as your case about when the Beatles were at Sullivan, Sullivan but pretty close um, eight years later and you know you say to yourself well you know particularly since UVM doesn't provide you know, it's really I really have a bone to pick about that because when I was in the city attorney's office in the late 80s and early 90s we tried to get Act 250 to order UVM to house more of its students yeah and I remember in that case, we kept asking in discovery for UVM to give us information on what percentage of their students they were housing. They couldn't give us consistent information. Every time we'd get a number from them, it would be a different number. And it was a mess. It was a total mess. And it, we, wow. we weren't successful in doing it. We weren't successful. And, they've, and that's a problem. Now, you know, Champlain has been pretty good about housing most, if not all their students. St. Mike's houses all of their students. When Trinity was around, they housed all their students. UVM never has. UVM's always has about half. Well, yeah, that's a state school versus private schools. What? A state school versus private schools. You, Wouldn't you the state me, require them? Me, tell me why, why, you know. Like, no, that's what I'm saying. Is that like the apartments that are being rented downtown? Yeah. Why, you know, why the University of Vermont isn't required to buy them up and provided them to their students on an affordable basis. That's what, that, how hard like, is that? Or, or better. I think a more radical concept is having students that rather than renting apartments in, in, in downtown Burlington, make them owners, have some kind of timeshare. So at least they have equity in the thing. So that first of all, they have pride of ownership. They keep the stuff up. And then when they get out, when they're, when their term is out, out of college, they may actually make a little money on it. Maybe not a lot, but at least they have ownership of the housing stock. That's an interesting concept. I think and so. then I think if they was, have something like and that, then, was, I, read, I think that was tried in some other community. I think even Berkeley may have even tried that on, a, on, a, on some kind of basis or, or co-ops or another, if you don't want to do a timeshare, mm -hmm. a co-op is yeah. another model where the apartment building is owned by, by a corporation and you own shares in the corporation as a tenant. So then when yeah. you turn over, the shares turn over, but there's, there's models to deal to deal with it. But the fundamental problem is you've got you've got students with parents with a lot of buying power that are that are that need housing in Burlington. That is a fundamental problem. There's been a lot of housing built. There's been a lot, you know cities like South Burlington. It's you know Peter Clavel when he was mayor he really began to press other communities like South Burlington to step up to the plate with affordable housing. They've been doing it. We, you know Williston's been doing it. There's affordable housing going up in the county now. It isn't just Burlington. But, you know, you've got demographic issues, number one, with the shrinking of family sizes. Uh, but in, Bur in Burlington, it's fundamentally UVM. It's just, you know, there, there's that huge demand for housing mm -hmm. on housing in town. Do you think, I'm curious, one of the things that I think is interesting, the functional family unit, the no more than four people, right. this is not necessarily the intent of this conversation, but... In when we lived in Los Angeles, we had friends because it's so unaffordable, um, or it's extremely expensive. Let me put it that way. Um, you had people doubling and tripling up in one bedroom apartments, 
where they block off, you know, the living room. So it's the person could have a little privacy and then somebody would have the bedroom or they might even have two bedrooms in one room. So there was always people exceeding the occupancy of rooms in the unit. Why is it that I, I feel like some of these laws and ordinances that are put into place have you know, we get back to the second and third order effects thing, right? So the, it seems like there was a, a reason and a rationality for it, but they didn't consider how that would actually affect people being able to live and comfortably. Right. Yep. Actually, some of the, uh, I was surprised in one of the elections, some of the, some of the progressive candidates uh, that were running actually in my ward in Ward 1 in Burlington were campaigning on the repeal of the functional family um, ordinance. Uh, the argument for it has always been that you have all these students crowded into these apartment buildings, sort of like as a rabbit warren. And yeah. then you have problems with noise, you have problems with traffic and cars, you have problem with trash collection. And it, and it, and it, uh, and it uh, undermines the, character, the, the residential character of the neighborhood. Mm. So that's the other side of the argument. But what happens is what, what really frustrates me about this is these, you know, now the big thing is people acting in silos, people are in little silos and they don't, the silos don't connect. Um, they don't, there isn't the question of, okay, what's the impact of that on affordable housing? The other thing is like, for example, limit, eliminating the amount of cars you can park on the lawns of these apartment buildings. That was a big thing. God, that was going on in the seventies and eighties. So all it did is push the cars out on the street. So now what they're doing now is they're trying to eliminate parking spaces on the street because they think that's going to, uh, that's going to do something with, with the climate change. Right? I don't, I don't believe that for a minute, but, and so there's no there's no there's no coherent uh, connection. Yeah. Various initiatives. I mean, something yeah. sounds good, and there's a big hue and cry about that, and then something else sounds good, and they work at cross purposes. And it doesn't matter if it makes sense or if it's reasonable or how it's going to affect people in the future. It's just like, ooh, we feel good about it. Right. Yep. Now, particularly now with social media, the feel good, the feel good thing, and then if you criticize something, you're an enemy of the people and you need to be um, you need to be canceled and shunned. Well, and that's what it feels time. like the, the one, you know, it's so fascinating. You know, these are the reasons why I don't trust the government. These are the reasons why I think government should be smaller. Like I get into arguments with people all the time about why I believe the things that I do. And I say, I'm a small government conservative. That means I don't think that the government should dictate so much about what I am and am not able to do in my life, in my own home, in your life and your home, in my business, in my commerce with landlording, which is, that's interesting. So human beings are selfish and self-centered by nature. And then they end up in positions of power. And then we're confused that they do dumb stuff or things that are not good for you, but are good for them and their friends. And, and then they give themselves immunity, levels and levels and levels of immunity. And people are like, why do you hate the government so much, Erica? Why are you a conservative? And I'm like, that's why. Yeah. And Let's nobody can- the last piece of immunity, by the way, we didn't get oh, to- Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Qualified immunity, which is what you we started Ooh. out. With. Ooh, okay. So hold on. Go. Wait, say that again. Qualified immunity. Okay. Qualified immunity is a. Uh, I kind of talked about it earlier because of Vermont lower level officials have qualified immunity, but where you see qualified immunity uh, come up most of the time is in lawsuits that are brought under the Federal Civil Rights Act, which is called Section 1983 doesn't have okay. anything to do with the year 1983. It just has to be, happens to be section 1983, of title 42 of the U.S. Code, uh, uh, which is the U.S. statutes. And what qualified immunity says is that in theory, you can sue government officials for violating your constitutional rights. But what, got, what qualified immunity does, it puts an enormous hurdle in that that says that the particular conduct, even if it violated the constitutional right, the fact that it violated the constitutional right, right 
has to have been clearly established by some prior precedent and that it violated your constitutional right has to be beyond debate. Okay. Um, and that's really almost an impossible standard to meet. That's why I was what like, what? I, that's crazy. What you just oh, said well, it gets was... worse. It gets worse. <laughs> so you have to show that it's been this particular fact pattern has in some prior case been ruled. And it has to be, by the way, in your jurisdiction, whether it's in Vermont or the second circuit, that this is a no, no. And you have to show it's beyond doubt that that was a no, no. And it was very clearly that that was a no, no. And then you can sue. But if you can't establish that, then even though the person probably did violate your constitutional rights, the poor official didn't really know for certain that he or she was violating your constitutional rights, and therefore you cannot you cannot sue them. Um, there is a wonderful decision that just came out by a judge in Mississippi, U.S. District Court of Mississippi, in August, called Jameson versus McClendon. And this judge went. This judge went through the history of sovereign immunity and traced its roots back to um, the efforts to undo Reconstruction after the Civil War. Ooh. And uh, he uh, and he talked about how it really goes after really very well. It's like an eighty-page decision. Absolutely wow. shatters the 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 uh, you know the the reasoning of sovereign immunity. Um. But the fundamental flaw is how can you establish that a particular conduct was violated constitutional rights if you need to show a prior case that showed that it violated constitutional rights, yeah. but that case can't be brought because there's been no prior case that showed that it violated constitutional yeah. rights. What this is what this is what when this particular judge didn't coin this phrase, but he cited another judge. He coined the phrase and he says he called it Section 1983 meets Catch 22. Section 1983 meets, meets Catch 22. Plaintiffs must provide precedent that the, the conduct violated the Constitution, even as fewer courts are making the precedent, because you can't make the precedent unless you can show there's a prior precedent. It shows that this activity is wrong. And, they, and there's one one example that this, this judge in Mississippi talked about. There's literally a case, I don't know which circuit it was. Some prisoner was held in a cell. He was held without clothes on in his feces and his own urine for three days. So they brought a 1983 claim against whoever was running the, the jail. And this is literally the rationale that the Court of Appeals used. Well, we have decisions that say it's a violation of your civil rights if they make you wallow in your own filth for seven days, but there aren't any precedents that say it's a violation of your constitutional rights to be required to wallow in your own filth for only three days, and therefore the suit against the prison officials was dismissed. I'm, this is the God's honest truth. That was actually a decision about one of the courts of appeals that was talked about in this Jameson case. So you can see why... Um, there's been uh, there's a growing um, movement afoot to and, and by the way sovereign immunity was uh, co completely court created and court created only in 1982. Only in 1982. Yeah. Really? Yep. Yep. What? That? Yep. Oh, so sovereign immunity wasn't a thing. Qualified qualified immunity under Section 1983. For oh, it wasn't that was 1982. Created by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1982. Wow. Speaking by Justice Rehnquist. Why? You own a summer home. Oh. Oh. What happened? Oh, oh, there we are. You froze a little bit. Okay, so it has so it passed in the Supreme Court in 1982. 82, yep. So this is a fairly, you know, um, for those of us who are the and the grumpy old men section of the Vermont Bar Association. Um, that's a fairly recent decision. Am I that's right? what I. So wait, did you? So what? What? What created qualified immunity? What well, case the was court, that? The Supreme Court. They, they just said we're qualified immunity for officials who are being sued for violating civil rights under Section 1983, and the argument was, well, you know, they really had to be on notice of what they were doing was wrong, and that you don't have some prior court precedent that says that was wrong, 
then they get off. They're off the hook because they weren't they weren't on notice that what they were doing was wrong. So therefore, you can allow somebody, you can hold somebody in a in jail cell for three days and three nights naked, wallowing in their own filth, and that's not a violent constitutional violation because there haven't been any precedents that say three days is too much, seven days is too much, but there's no precedent. So then the question was, how did seven days ever get decided? It probably yeah. shouldn't have been this because that was only decided because somebody slipped one past the goal. You know, so the problem is, is exactly catch twenty two meets uh, section nineteen eighty three meets catch twenty two. I I can't every time we talk about this stuff, John, my head hurts. It should. And I get mad. It should and it's like I don't, I can't like the I can't, I can't do the mental gymnastics required to make that make sense. It shows that you're emotionally healthy. And that's what I'm like, I'm not a dumb person. Like I'm, you know, I'm not the smartest person on earth, but I'm reasonably intelligent and I can decipher meaning from things. And that I can't. Only lawyers could think that makes sense. Yep. Or like, was everybody on acid this whole time? Has everybody just been like eating mushrooms and then being like, we're just, we're just going to write our opinion and some laws. And, uh. All designed to protect officials from 1983 suits. And the basic idea is that um, they don't want uh, taxpayers to be having to pay out money mm -hmm. because government officials violate people's civil rights. <laughs> <laughs> now, what this decision talks about when they go back to Reconstruction was yeah. that these laws were enacted by Congress after the Civil War precisely so that government officials would be held accountable when they violated people's civil rights. That was the whole point. Correct. Right. Oh, my God, John. Okay, so basically, okay, so I want to leave with some hope, okay? Because I said, what can we do? And you said, we got to change the political culture uh, so that there, some of this stuff isn't so nonsense. But also what I'm hearing you say that you didn't explicitly say is we need to get liberty-minded people to go to college and be lawyers and then judges. Well, um, not necessarily. We need to have the people that go to college and become lawyers and judges to actually have, a little, I think, a little more common sense. <laughs> to get away from this culture of parsing everything to death, that's all they teach them. Um, mm. And that's that's very expensive. And I think maybe. Oh, I'm losing you again, John. Say that again. I'm losing you. No. Oh, did we lose John again? Will uh, it be forever? You? Okay. There we go. Okay. So you said they that not that liberty minded necessarily that but that people who do go to law school need common sense. Yeah, and also the, I mean the political culture of this stuff I think needs to change. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 left, but I consider myself libertarian. Um, and you yeah. say so. I, what really I really get offended by government overreach. It just drives me crazy. I've represented yeah. a number of very conservative people, and I'm happy to do it. Happy yeah. to. Do it. Yeah, uh, I love well, people on, on particularly First Amendment issues where I completely disagree with them politically, but it's the principle of uh, of uh, you know the government is overreaching or some officials overreach because they don't like what this person's politics are. Yep. Oh wait, so you're a real liberal? Oh, don't like, what? I'm a liberal. I'm not a liberal. I know. Well, I think of people don't realize that our constitution. Uh, 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 Keep in mind that the the left in the '60s was libertarian. I mean. That was the Woodstock left. That was the Woodstock left. I mean, it was like, hey. That's a, the Constitution, like people, the Constitution is a very liberal Constitution. This idea that everybody should get to do whatever they want to do and be left alone. Like, that's but actually a liberal concept. But What's that? I think that's a very, very much an oversimplification. Of oh, maybe it is. All right, so. We've come around the hour. We got a lot of really good information. John, thank you so much for everything. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor. 
do 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 it's perihelion design uh beautiful beautiful jewelry and uh that i love um i've got something similar to this this tree um it is hand wrapped and uh with hand picked stones I got a custom one with aquamarine because that's my birthday and I'm special. She does earrings, bracelets, necklaces, anything. She can custom make you stuff. If you find beads or stones that you think are really cool and you want her to make you something, you can have her do that. And there's actually a lot of her pieces that are one of a kind because of that. She'll find some stone or some uh, pendant or something like that that she thinks is super dope and she will make a piece out of it so you might even get a 60 dollar necklace that nobody else in the world is going to have who else can say that let's see oh wait okay here we go let's do this so as a matter of fact ooh, let me make myself big here you can see my earrings. Check out my earrings. These are perihelion design earrings. I believe they're called like Egyptian goddess or something like that. They're amazing. Absolutely. They're beautiful. What's that, John? It absolutely. Yeah. Hey, if you've got any, if you're, it, you got an anniversary coming up, is it your wife's birthday? You can go to perihelion design doc, uh, perihelion vermont.com. That's P E R. I H E L I O N V T dot com to get really amazing jewelry. Check it out. And uh, thank you again, Mr. Franco. Uh, if you want to, do you want to share like how people can get in touch with you? If they want to have you fight for them for some dumb crap, like you you're doing for me, uh, is, do you, you have a website, right? I think I put that in the, in the description. Yeah. I have John Franco Law website. Um, I have an email address. Uh, people will laugh. It's old school. It's John Franco Law, J O H N F R A N C O L A W at AOL.com. <gasps> what? Yes. Who yes. has an AOL account still? People who were born in the Truman administration. That's who. <laughs> that's who. <laughs> Well, thank you, John. Thank you for fighting the good fight. Thank you for um, being a part of what is good about being in Burlington and um, and fighting for people's civil rights. I think that's really amazing and thank very you. much needed. Erica, be well. Yes, be well. you too. Thanks. All right, everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Oh.